worth 1,000 words where this channel began. And there is irony in that statement because if you are watching this on the day this video is published, I am also having a live stream, ask me anything, hang out, chat, whatever you wanna call it, to celebrate that very humble milestone. So if you are new to this channel and you have no idea what the hell this is, let me explain it to you briefly. If you already know what this is, you can check out the chapter selection below and move on to the artwork and the story. But for the new people here, this is what this is. It is a writing exercise, an experiment that I set out for myself. And if you're here for the book reviews and didn't know I wrote, well, I also write books. I came up with this premise uh, called Worth 1000 Words, where I take an artwork, use it as a writing prompt and write a 1000 word, exactly 1000 word short story on the spot, no outline, I sit down, I look at it, I put some music on, and I just go and I time myself. It was a means for me to explore other genres, other voices, and just uh, have a good time, I guess. Learn some things. That project went on for two years straight. Uh, every single week I released a short story. I felt like it was great for my writing muscles. However, I got a request on my Discord server, and if you are not on my Discord server and you wanna hang out with me and all of the other amazing people there, Check out the link in the description. It's completely free to join. He is a concept artist and he said he enjoyed the series and was wondering if I would write a story based on one of his pieces. And that is what I'm going to do today. He submitted this piece of artwork himself, so I did not just pick it from his art station profile. However, if you would like to see all of his work, as always, I put the links to all of that down in the description below. So that is the long and short of it. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna say that I'm going to start doing these weekly again, but if you out there enjoy the writing videos and wanna see me create more of these stories because at the very end of the video, I analyze it, I, I talk about my thought process, techniques I used, uh, successes and failings, of course, because these are not all winners, but you are always welcome to request another video, send some artwork, request an artist, whatever it may be. And I'm more than happy to do one of these. And let's just say I was a little bit rusty. This one took me about two hours to write, but that is okay. It's been, I think, nine months, according to YouTube's calendar, the last time I wrote one of these short stories. But it is not only the artist I mention in this video, it's also the music I listen to because uh, listening to music while writing is, is very important to me, particularly when I'm doing these short stories. It just gets me in the right mood. You know, ideally, I'll pick something that represents the genre. Today's genre is fantasy. So I picked an album called Star Lore. It's kind of this dungeon synth thing. If you don't know what dungeon synth is, it's almost um, kind of an 80s synth vibe, but really old school sounding, usually melancholic, usually reminiscent of those times, of those Dungeons and Dragons times. But this album is by an artist called And. <laughs> Hopefully I can pronounce this. Ain Dual Madir. Fear not, the link will be down in the description below. And I felt like it suited this piece beautifully because there's a snowy landscape in the artwork. The album art had a snowy landscape. It felt perfect. So without further ado, let us check out today's artwork. Today's artwork is titled Temple in the Snowy Rocks and it's by a concept artist from San Diego, California named Ricky Ho. So let us take a closer look at this piece. We have a man who looks uncannily like. Sean Bean is Eddard Stark from Game of Thrones, at least from the back. Looks like he might be holding on to a sword on his belt or maybe a dagger of some kind. But more interestingly is what we see in the distance. These buildings that appear to be carved from stone. But more interestingly is what rises above it. And it's this crazy rock formation. These remind me of things I've seen in um, photos. I've never been there, but in Utah where they have a very small end and it seems like they are balanced precariously so. And this thing is rising up almost ready. It looks like it's going to fall on this on all of these structures down below. And there's also a light, some kind of light within it at the very base of it. So it makes me wonder what's going on in there. Is it a factory of some kind? Are there some dwarves making some things? I have no idea. There's also a frozen river encircling this entire thing. But this man is looking upon the snowy landscape. Why is he here? What is he looking for? Well, that is my job to find out. So Ricky, thank you for requesting this. It's a fantastic piece of artwork. I am honored to write a story to it. Hopefully I can do it justice. With that said, let's see what I came up with. This was the worst part Juran had found. Their thin skin, frail limbs, and emotionless eyes. Looking older than the snow-capped structures they sat among. Places of worship, living quarters, staircases leading to both, men and women alike, though not as they should be. No conversation or song, no holding of hands, 
no resting upon shoulders or bosoms for comfort, for closeness. This wasn't living, but live they did, in the shadow of a great riddle writ by the old gods, shaped, well, like a colossal mushroom, rising from the stone and possibly above him and them. Juran had spotted many just like it on his journey here, albeit miniature, clustered on the forest floor as if foreshadowing his destination. He made sure to clean where they had touched his cloak and boots, so their spores would perish in the ice and cold. The temple could not be sullied. He looked at his boots now, the mud there, some dry, some wet. How much of that would be sacrilege? He had no time to ponder further. As he pressed on, a boy appeared at the bottom of a great staircase. Curiosity cocked his head like an animal. He sniffed the air like one too, then patted on all fours, keeping to the purple shadows that grew across the cobbles and slush. Juran took one step forward, and the boy dashed into the sun. Juran's hand went to his belt dagger and immediately regretted granting a sliver of steel, a glimpse of sun, and the boy a glimpse of it. The child showed the whites of his eyes, innocence and fear intermingled. Yet, he did not flee. Nor did he flinch when the click of hilt to scabbard made voice. He merely grasped Juran's forward boot and pounded his fist upon the leather. Get off! the boy shouted. Off, off, off! Feet crunched in the snow as the disciples gathered around them both, keeping their distance, of course, which Juran never liked. He was nothing special. He would break bread with them, have conversation with them, if they allowed. Off, I say! The boy had split the leather with a rock, which he hammered on Juran's ankle. All right, boy, Juran said. Calm yourself. I mean you no harm. Sobs consumed the boy. <laughs> then move. Juran stepped back, and the disciples recoiled into hoods and alleyways. The boy sat back on his heels with a look of defeat, a look that should not grace one so young, and it whittled at Juran's ribs. For whatever I've done, Juran said, I am sorry. The boy rocked forward and back with cupped hands into which he peered intently. You killed him, my friend. Whoever your friend is, I assure you, I meant no harm. The boy sniffled. All things must end, all things must bury. Star to stone we are, neath the shadow we must be ferried. Juran had heard this prayer many times and in many places, just like this one though never from the mouth of a child, for children were not made for this place, these places. Who is this child's mother? Jern asked anyone who would answer. The solemn note of a breeze was his only response, because they all had fled. All but the boy. I have no mother, the boy said. Every boy has a mother? Not me, not him. He flattened his hand to show Jern what lay there. A snow-blue beetle crushed. Your friend, the boy nodded. Perhaps we bury him together? The boy nodded again. Juran led him to a square of soil, free of ice, behind an abandoned hovel. Here, look, even a sprout grows. He shall nourish it. Flowers eat bugs? Yes, and Juran thought better of finishing. Fine. The boy made a fist-sized grave and placed the beetle in it before covering it up. He lay a single stone on top. Fine indeed, Juran said, then stood, the sun already coasting past midday, which meant he was running out of time. Who are you? The boy asked. A priest. You don't look like a priest. What does a priest look like? Not like you. You'll have to trust me then. The boy only offered a sidelong glance. Then, can I come with you? With me? To summon the flame. A chill not born of ice nested inside Juran. You may not. Why? It is not for the eyes of children. I am no child. A scoff Juran could not find, so he set off to the base of the temple, his destination, where great pillars supported an entrance blacker than night tall as a giant, quiet here, colder. 
he turned to find the boy carefully stepping in his footprints behind him. An animal he was. Clever, but an animal nonetheless, he told himself. Go on then, Juran said and held out the igniting stone, cupped in both hands. The boy took the offering and went to the entrance mouth and cast it inside. Echoes of stardust and a warmth you could hear turned Juran on his heel and sent him to the temple outskirts. Breathless, the boy caught up to him. Thank you. Juran put his hand on his dagger in case the boy tried to breach the temple boundary. Only one foot had, which the boy noticed and pulled it back across the threshold. No dead beetle there, just pure white snow. He left the boy without answering, because no answer would be good enough, and didn't face the temple again until he had crossed the frozen river that encircled it. The funnel-like temple looked less like a mushroom now, and more like a great wave ready to crash upon those below it. The old ones. The young one. Whose stare traversed that distance to Juran as an arrow might. The entrance between the pillars grew hot and red. The earth shuddered deep and fierce. This was the best part, Juran told himself. As he always did, this was the best part. Welcome to the end, dear viewer. I am so glad you made it. This is where I talk about my final thoughts, what I liked, what I didn't like, and maybe what I learned. So let us take a look at this story. Uh, like I said earlier in the video, it took me a lot longer than normal to write this story. Uh, I, I've been out of practice, let's say, for nine months. So this one took me about two hours to complete, which is okay. It's okay. I mean, there's been other stories that have taken me that long by far, but I would say I, I average normally at a very shorter time, but nonetheless, let's talk about the story. So it is about a man named Juran, and he is a priest, we find out. Um, I think that's where I'd like to start first, is that um, when I look at this image, this guy looks like a warrior. He looks like he's wearing armor of some kind. Perhaps he has a sword at his belt. We can't quite see, but it looks like he's holding on to something. So that is the first thing I wanted to change. I wanted a little bit more irony there, something a little more unexpected um, because irony is such a powerful thing in storytelling. And I know that 99% of people who are probably going to read this story at some point are not going to see the image. So they're going to be reading the words for what it is. But for me, anyway, that was important to create a sense of irony by changing the character from what you would expect to something that could be unexpected. Also, another thing I, will, I would like to mention is um, I kind of did some full circle action here to a degree, to a degree. Uh, if you don't know me very well, I, I love when stories, uh, the beginning kind of mirrors the end to a degree. And so we find this man, Juran. Uh, he's talking about this was the worst part. What was the worst part? But it's something that he had found. Uh, there's thin skin, frail limbs, emotionless, emotionless eyes. So the first thing that came to mind when I was writing this story, and it changed as I got through it, as stories often do, is I wanted this man to, uh, and maybe it's a failing on my part. Maybe I couldn't uh, come up with a way to fully convey it. But I wanted him to seem empathetic at the beginning of the story. And at the very end, I wanted him to be revealed as a very evil man, someone who gets pleasure in the destruction that he is about to bring. Didn't really end up that way. It ended up being um, that he's kind of in a situation where he's trying to convince himself like that this is good, this is for the greater good, because the beginning starts with, like I said, this was the worst part. And the very end of the story, we see this was the best part, Juran told himself. The key word being told himself, not that he found. As he always did, this was the best part for emphasis. So I, I would highly recommend if you're writing a short story, even novels, I think it's so important to have the beginning and the ending mirror in such a way. They don't have to be polar opposites. They don't have to have the character start where they began or end where they began. Um, just use it as a tool in some way to convey thematically what you're trying to get across. I think that's, a, that's the best time to do it. Clearly, it can be a little bit on the nose sometimes, so be wary of that. But anyway, this guy Jern is sitting here and he's looking at all these old people, all of these disciples as I call them. They're kind of huddled around these old buildings, living quarters, staircases leading to both men and women alike, but they're not as they should be, he notes. They are not holding hands. They are not having conversations. They are not singing. They are not being a merry folk, let's say. But they did live, as he notes. And this is when I first bring in uh, the, the, the image of that giant mushroom sculpture. I struggled a little bit. <laughs> Uh, thinking about how to describe it. Uh, so I just went with here. It's almost as if my, my thoughts are on the page when it says, shaped well like a colossal mushroom, rising from the stone and possibly above him and them. 
I think that is one failing in the story is that uh, maybe I could have described this structure more clearly. So you get uh, the reader gets a better sense of where they are in this world. But what was funny is I got into the conversation with, with this man, Juran, and this kid that he finds. And uh, the conversation, as it always does when you're typing dialogue, sometimes it just flows back and forth. And before I knew it, I was getting toward the end of the story. And that's really why um, this story took me so long, so long to write. Ironically, it was the word constraint, uh, hitting that exact 1,000 words and making sure the story came to a conclusion. So I struggled a bit with that. I think I had the framework of the story down by the time, uh, you know, pretty early anyway, maybe an hour and a half. It was just that word count, the word count. So that's why I, I highly recommend exercises like these if you're trying to practice writing or if you're in a rut and you need to do something else do this. So I equated that image with uh, ones that he found in the forest, these little mushrooms that he found on his journey here. But then he made sure to uh, clean his boots and his cloak of them before he set foot in the temple because it is sacred ground, he knows, sacred ground. And I'm not sure, <laughs> I'm not sure really what this is going to do. So he looked at his boots now, the mud there, some dry, some wet somewhat how much of that would be sacrilege i started talking about how some of this mud might have been from his homeland where he came from and and there was some subtext there around him crossing this boundary with bits of his home intact or maybe he's missing his home i, I deleted that kind of regret it it was a word count thing so i'm not sure how much purpose this paragraph holds but anyway let us move on and this is when he sees the boy and the boy really was the figure, he was the character I brought in to give this man pause because we find out later in the story that he's kind of, he, this is his job. He goes from play, temple to temple and for some reason he destroys it. He, he summons the flame as he calls it. Maybe it has to do with something else. I have no idea. I will let your imagination run wild with that. And I think that's important too, is that don't always try to explain every little thing in these stories, right? Le leave some things for the reader's imagination because Sometimes it's more powerful that way. Often it's more powerful that way. So he gets scared by this boy. He goes to his dagger. And I, I kind of like this line um, because it shows something of Juran's character. And you can see myself failing in the story in that regard with what I wanted to do, making him an evil man. And I try to give little subtextual hints here and there. And I'll note them as we go forward. Uh, how this boy is kind of chipping away at the icy heart he has. But his hand went to his belt dagger and immediately regretted granting a sliver of steel a glimpse of sun and the boy a glimpse of it. So that's kind of parallelism. It's kind of sing-songy, uh, poetic writing, but it's purposeful, right? I, I know you might say, see that and think, oh, it's kind of purple, but I feel like it's a fantasy setting. It feels fitting to me. And also there's there's purpose, as I mentioned. There's a parallel story there because, you know, he's showing the silver to the sun glinting, but then he's he feels bad about the boy seeing it because he feels guilty that um, he almost drew steel on a boy. And of course the boy is frightened. He's innocent, uh, but he's also fearful, but he didn't, he didn't flee. He charged toward Juran and pounded at his boot. Get off, get off, get off. And this is a little bit of foreshadowing. Um, I don't think it really quite played out the way I'd hoped, but maybe it was useful to you. Maybe it was interesting to you. This is when we find out that Juran has stepped on a bug. And the boy is very sad because we know that Juran is going to set something into action that is going to kill all of these people at the very end. I don't show that it's happening. I infer that it's happening. Another thing that's very important. So he lifts his boot and he sees this poor dead bug and he offers to bury the bug. I think in hindsight, I might have changed it to where um, Juron kind of walks forward toward his duty, right? Because he's kind of like, that's a bug. I don't give a shit. And it's kind of emphasizing the fact that he doesn't care a whole lot, which might be counterintuitive or, or counter to him feeling bad at the very beginning, seeing all these old people. Anyway, I know the emotional arc is a little bit off in this one, but let me know what you think. Let me know what you were thinking while you, while you read it. So he goes off and he uh, offers to bury this bug with the boy but before that the boy says kind of a little prayer a little song and it's all things must end all things must bury star to stone we are neath the shadow we must be ferried so what i wanted to do as well is more ironing right and i don't think this is particularly unique you see this often in stories you see this often in films where children sometimes can be more mature than their years and that is what i was trying to do here that he's almost accepting his fate at this moment this is the turning point well i shouldn't say a turning point but it, it's kind of is for Juran and the boy. It, he's he's seeing this dead bug. He's realizing that this bug is no longer and that that is something he is going to face very soon. And we learn that he knows this coming up when he's when he asked to follow this man. So anyway, Juran tries to find out who this uh, 
who this child's mother is. Nobody answers, of course, because all of these disciples are fearful, which is kind of a great contrast, I think, is that you have these adults who are f- fearful because they have this knowledge. And, and you think the boy is innocent and he's ignorant, but he also carries that knowledge. But he is fearless. He joins Juran up to this the base of this temple to ignite this fire, to, to basically have everything come down and collapse. And even at the end, he hesitates. He doesn't run away. He knows his duty. He knows he can't cross the boundary, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So yes, Juran uh, offers to bury this poor little bug with him. And this is a little bit where um, the boy's innocence kind of perks his head up. So we're getting a little bit of a contrast here where he's mature, but he's also innocent. So flowers eat bugs. And Juran begins to say yes and people too, but he stops himself because he's the adult. He's trying to save this child from the realities of life. But then the boy goes on to question him. And he says he's a priest. And you don't look like a priest. And this was kind of a little fun back and forth. I like to do this sometimes. I don't, it's funny, I don't do this often in novels for some reason. I think this is a technique that I should probably go back to because it really helps things flow, move them along. There's a lot of subtext in these lines. There's a lot of clues as to who Juran really is, how he feels, the same thing as the boy. The boy's almost standing up to him right here when he asks, you don't look like a priest. Well, what does a priest look like? Not like you. So he doesn't, he doesn't go into a lot of detail into what a priest looks like, but he's Looking at him curiously right here, the boy only offered a sidelong glance and then, can I come with you? So he believes him right after he says, you'll have to trust me then. So is that naive for the boy or something else? Who knows? So he goes and he knows, he even knows what he's there to do to summon the flame because he admits he's a priest, he trusts him, so he knows what the next step in his fate is. But here we see a chill not born of ice nested inside Jiren. So it's chipping away at that icy heart. Which again, I kind of regret at the beginning. I would probably change it to where he looks at these people as, as more animalistic. Just less than human, right? Because he's got to convince himself. Maybe the boy is what chips the ice away at his heart and it makes him human. But I also like the idea of him being an evil man. I don't know. I'd have to fix the story quite a bit to get that to work. But he says, no, it is not for the eyes of children. And he says, I am no child. And Juron's like, whatever, this kid's crazy. So he goes up there. But then he finally turns, sees him stepping into his footprints in the snow, which is, you know, a homage to Danny in The Shining when um, he's running away from his dad in the, in the hedge maze and he's got it. he tricks him by backing up and then hiding and then the dad gets there and he's like I don't know where this kid goes so that was a little bit of an homage to that I feel like it's undeveloped he notices that he's clever so maybe he thinks he's going to hide behind a rock and he's not going to know he's there because he's not going to see another set of footprints I'm not quite sure what I was getting in here but he does admit that he was clever for uh, some <laughs> some reason that I did not develop but then he decides to give him this igniting stone. And the boy takes it immediately and throws it. And echoes of stardust and a warmth you could hear turn Jiren on his seal. So even Jiren at this point, uh, the stardust kind of goes back to the little prayer that the boy said when he's talking about, you know, we're made of stardust essentially. And Jiren, I I did this for two reasons. Uh, one reason being why I quickened Jiren's uh, journey down to the hills. I was running out of words. I was running out of time. Uh, but also I think it helps emphasize his urgency to get the hell out of there. He's feeling somewhat attached to the situation or this people or this boy, and he is running away from his emotion. And then the last thing the boy says to him is a simple thank you. Uh, that just popped out. I, I, I was actually going to continue on the dialogue further, and it just felt right to me. There's no more information other than a thank you. He helped him bury his bug. He let him cast a stone, which is really the catalyst of his own fate and his people's fate. So it's kind of a sad story in that regard. And here's a little bit of a mirror of, of an image that happened before. I'm sure you caught it because it's not that hidden. But Juran, even now, he's ready to strike this boy down because he can't leave the boundary of the temple. And so he takes out his dagger, almost, just almost. But then the boy notices his foot had just crossed the same foot Juron had his, his foot out, the one that squashed the bug. That is a mirror image of what we see here. But there is no dead beetle, just pure white snow. Potentially a symbol of the boy's innocence, but I could just be completely bullshitting. <laughs> but then he left the boy without answering because no answer would be good enough and didn't face the temple again until he had crossed the frozen river that encircled it. So right now I am putting you in the artwork. This is the artwork as it is displayed. We have this uh, the base of the temple ignited with fire that is going to bring this thing all the way down. And we have the man looking out upon this site, but we also we also see that the funnel-like temple didn't look less like a mushroom now and more like a great wave ready to crash upon those below it, which that is what it's going to do. The old ones, 
the young one whose stare traversed that distance to Juran as an arrow might, stabbing him in his poor heart. And then we can see that things begin to progress. The interest be between the pillars grew hot and red. The earth shuddered deep and fierce. And as you already know, this was the best part, Juran told himself. As he always did, this was the best part. So overall, I think it's an okay story. There's some things I would definitely change. There were some things that I would, from a character standpoint, emphasize more. As much as I love the idea of this guy being truly evil, and maybe I could potentially go back and fix that, sometimes you just go where the story takes you. And particularly in these situations when you're just writing against the clock, your subconscious takes over. So you tend to do things that you lean into often. And I always love internal struggles with characters. And so that I think is the reason why I ended up at this state, even though I set out to do something very different. So I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily. And also your subconscious can take you to very, very strange places that you did not expect. But sometimes you just need to get the fingers flying on the keyboard and see where it takes you. Well, I hope you enjoyed the story. Let me know in the comments below. If you would like to read it, I will also put a link down below that will take you to my site if you do not want to hear me read it to you or if you want to see the line-by-line -line work itself. It is not edited any further, just like I always do. Once the clock stops, the writing stops. And I will mention again that if anybody out there would like to see another one of these videos, I'm not sure if I'll ever come back to these on my own. Maybe if I get inspired by something, perhaps, but I don't know if I'll do a week by week thing again. But you know the story about that. So I will leave it at that. Thanks again, Ricky, for submitting this artwork and pushing me to do another one of these. I had a great time. It was very nostalgic for me because this is how the channel began. And I, I learned so much, uh, met so many great people with this series, even though it has very, very few views. And I'm glad that people find them useful still. So keep reading, keep writing, and I will see you in the next one. Bye. If you'd like to read the story in its non-video format, check the link in the description. I didn't edit anything else, promise. Thanks again.